Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to CEPS. We meet here today on the week of midsummer. This is a week when the sun basically never drops in Sweden. So it's a perfect day to open this discussion uh, on how we may create an EU representative democracy fit for the future, to draw on one of the Commission's favorite sayings these days. And thanks to the sun staying up all day, we can also talk for the rest of the night. No, joke aside, I know that you have also very um, equally important matters to deal with. So my role here today will actually be to police this seminar, to make sure that we finish this two hours long seminar on time. But before initiating the discussion, I would like to present our excellent panel and also give you a brief overview of today's seminar. So we will first hear an introduction by the CIEPS di director, Göran von Sydow, who is also a senior researcher in political science and one of the two editors of this volume that will be discussed here today. Here it is. Um, we will then hear Sonja Punzer Rikman present her chapter in the volume. And Sonja is a professor emerita at the Salzburg University in Austria. Next contribution is by Ben Kram, who is a professor of political science at the Vrije University in Amsterdam. And after this, we will hear the other editor of the volume, uh, Valentin Kreilinger, who is also a senior researcher in political science here at CIEPS. After Valentin, we will have a short break. Uh, I think we need to keep it very short because I'm expecting a, a very, uh, an excellent discussion among the panelists also. And then we will hear Christopher Lord uh, joining us here today uh, by Zoom due to some flight problems this morning. And Christopher is a professor at ARENA, uh, the Center for European Studies at the University of Oslo. And finally, before opening the discussion uh, between the panelists, we will also hear a presentation by Aziz Ahuja, who is uh, the, a director from the Government Secretariat for EU Affairs at the Prime Minister's office. And she will actually also uh, talk about from a practitioner's view on the Conference of Europe. So we will hear Sonia talk about it from the research perspective, and then we will hear Aziz uh, add some practical perspectives. As I said, we will try to find uh, some room for a short break uh, after four presentations and we will open the floor for some questions around 11.15. And since we are on a tight schedule, I will notify all speakers when, there remain, when two um, minutes remain. I will use my, my colleague Eleanor in the audience to show you a sign. Uh, please, Jöran, you may now have the floor for your opening. Well, thank you so much, Anna, and uh, also on my side, uh, very welcome here to CIEPS. Now, it's been almost four months uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, began. And why do I begin with this note in the context of a seminar on democracy? Well, the truth is that democracies are very much less prone to go to war with democratic neighbors than autocracies. And it's also a sign of warning when one reads the latest report from the VDAM Institute of Gothenburg University, because they measure democracies across the globe. And in their most recent report, they find that the share of the world's population enjoying living in democracies today are now back to the levels of 1989, which means that the big change that we witnessed after the end of the Cold War, war has more or less disappeared and that there has been a negative development over the last decade, globally speaking. But it also relates to the European Union. In the very same report, they find that six out of the 27 member states of the European Union are indeed moving in the wrong direction when it comes to democracy. In the context of European Union, we primarily talk about issues such as the rule of law, media freedom, freedom of speech, and all of these other matters that are also important to democracy, particularly if one considers the concept of liberal democracy or constitutional democracy. But in today's seminar, we will primarily focus on the other element of democracy, that is representation, how citizens' views are channeled into public decision making. And that also comes in a context where representative democracy, which is a sort of very important feature of all our societies, 
are challenged a little bit. And those challenges come in various forms. One is that from what we know as populism, that tend to think that representative democracy is somewhat too elitist and often skews the real popular will of the people and that it gets lost in that translation which is the, the sort of working of representative democracy. So populists, they often question representation in the way in which we know it and the parliamentary life and they look for other methods and means to strengthen democracy. And then there is another set of questioning of representative democracy, which would rather point to the slowness of representative democracy, that it produces suboptimal outcomes, and that sometimes parliamentary life is too complicated to produce outcomes at all. We know that living in Sweden over the last few years, how that can be. We also know that looking at the post-election discussions in France, all of a sudden being very confused about how to create majorities. But that kind of critique often comes from a more technocratic point of view, that this is not an optimal version of how to run a society. So that's the general picture. Now, in this seminar, we will focus primarily on specific issues relating to the European Union. In a multi-level system, it is also sometimes hard to find the place, the proper place for representative democracy. Now, obviously, this discussion is by no means new. We know it since many decades, the issue of, re of democratic deficit in the European Union. But just let me remind you about what the treaty says, which is always a good point of departure when looking at the European Union. In Article 10 of the Lisbon Treaty, I will read it to you now. The functioning of the Union shall be founded on representative democracy. Citizens are directly represented at the Union level in the European Parliament. Member states are represented in the European Council by their heads of state or government and in the Council by their governments themselves democratically accountable either to their national parliaments or to their citizens. And I think that, and then it continues also with the role of citizens and the role of political parties in the European Union. But I think it's quite clear that you see these two channels, the two ways in which citizens' uh, expressions can be part of European governance. It goes either through the member state way, national elections, forming national parliaments and governments that represent the member states in the council, or let's say the intergovernmental part of the EU. But then also the supranational, which is members, voters voting for a supranational directly elected parliament, unique for the European Union, which also represents the member states at the EU level and also holds the executive to account at the European Union level. But these two channels also represent in some way different versions of what the EU is, which also reflects on how grave researchers would think that the issue of the democratic deficit is. If you were to see the EU primarily as an inter intergovernmental international organization, then the issue of democratic deficit becomes less grave because the notion of a potential exit from the EU would always be the escape route. So, you know, the argument being that as long as we are members, we accept the EU with all the faults it has, even on democratic standards, because there we know that we can leave the European Union. This is a very intergovernmental idea. The other version would be, well, in fact, the EU is developing quite a lot. It's a process and it exercises power and authority over citizens, which makes it more look like more of something that is in the making of a state building process. And if you take that view on the EU, then issues of democratic deficit becomes much more serious and a serious concern. And add to that the idea of the EU being a process that developments over time. And what we've seen over the last few decades, at least, is that European governance also concerns issues that are much more salient, that are politicized, that are politically sensitive to citizens. And that also requires a different set of legitimation of those citizens. Compare sort of early days of integration, maybe more technical things, quite remote, not a big democratic problem. Compare that to, for instance, governance during the Euro crisis or indeed the situations in which we find ourselves now. So it's a greater call for asking oneself how to organize 
representative democracy in the European Union. And there is also a challenge in the sense that political parties are key players and vehicles for connecting citizens to public decision making. That's the channel in which we orient ourselves in terms of the conflicts, in terms of seeking accountability and shifts in power in a peaceful manner. But political parties also find it quite difficult to find their proper role in this multi-level system. They are primarily still national parties, but they cooperate in the European level party system. But finding those links are somewhat difficult. So in that sense, what the EU has done over the last few years is also to try a, to be a little bit innovative and go beyond classical modes of representative democracy. We see that through, for instance, the use of referenda over EU issues. We see that in the use of citizens' panels, of citizens' consultations, and various other ways to engage citizens in EU governance. This has been particularly the case in the now closed, uh, now concluded Conference on the Future of Europe, which has worked heavily on these matters, and we will talk about these in this context of the of the, this, this seminar. Now, this conference on the future of Europe has been concluded, but it's also an after this conference, because now all the EU institutions are thinking about what to do with the conclusions coming out of this conference. And these conclusions, they include such things that maybe we should have better functioning transnational lists ahead of European Parliament elections to make it more properly pan-European. Maybe we should secure that the model that is called Spitzenkandidaten, you know, the way in which the uh, European Parliament election will also reflect the choice of the next Commission president. Maybe the European Parliament would say we would also need the right to initiative in order to make it a properly functioning supranational parliament. Well, that's just a number of these issues that are on the agenda and that needs to be talked about in Europe. And I know that the European Council later on this week will indeed also make their assessment of how to proceed in these matters. That was my short introduction to this very broad theme. And I'm now very much looking forward. And I want to thank also on my, beside, my side all the contributors and these wonderful scholars to this little vo volume. And uh, I'm now leaving back to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Joran, for your introduction, sharing some perspectives on, on, on the challenges that, are, uh, uh, that, that the EU is facing in view of representative democracy. We will now open the, the panel and we will start by, by Sonia puncher rickman who will share her perspectives that are based on the volume that we have, uh, are discussing here today. So please, Sonia. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and for giving me the floor first of all <laughs> panelists. Um, my contribution to the volume uh, bore the title can, well, the European representation conundrum, and I think Guran has hinted to this uh, as well. Uh, and my question was, can or could the conference, now that it is over, resolve it? Now, why conundrum? I am deeply concerned about how the representatives of the European Union um, appear before the European public, but also before uh, the world, um, by rendering the question who represents whom, what and why, ever more complicated. And if we need a very recent example in this uh, respect, just think of uh, Scholz, Macron, Draghi, and the Romanian counterpart uh, going to Kiev. Why these four? Are they the representatives of the European Union in this very critical situation? We had Ursula von der Leyen uh, briefly before that. We had uh, Michel uh, as the uh, council president going to Kiev. So who, who are they actually representing? <laughs> and what are they bringing to Kiev? Promises that they can actually live up to in the future? 
or not, because in the end you would need a either consensus or even a unanimous vote in uh, the Council or the European Council, depending on the matter you are tackling. Now, we could say, well, this is the situation we live in and um, this is the best <laughs> that we get. I don't think this is appropriate to the situation. We live in a very, what I call, wicked crisis and here there should be a much clearer um, positioning of the European Union also in terms of representation. However, in my contribution to the volume, I did not even touch upon the war, <laughs> but uh, on, on other uh, issues that were important uh, up to now, in particular also the, the fiscal and the financial and fiscal crisis. There again, if I may recall that example, we had all of a sudden a player becoming the most important one, which we did not foresee in that version and that is the European Central Bank. European Central Bank was never conceived as a lender of last resort, but that is what it eventually became de facto. So, having said that, um, I wonder whether the European Union is well served with this kind of experimental forms of representation. Uh, Goran has uh, and I thank you for that, already read out Article 10 and what it meant for representation, so I don't need to do that. But in that respect, it's quite clear who is in charge of what. And uh, nevertheless, we have these problems. In particular, when the financial and fiscal crisis broke out in the first phase of problem uh, definition, by the way, and problem solving, it was the European Council uh, that held a plethora of, of summits in order to come to terms with that crisis. And I am afraid, and I look <laughs> at our representative of uh, the Swedish government, um, I am afraid I'm a bit skeptical about the outcome of uh, this conference. I got through uh, the various subjects uh, once again after the conclusion and I uh, would like to share with you a couple of provocative uh, thoughts and then we, I would be happy to discuss this. What comes out of this conference is, and I hope everybody forgives me who has taken part in that, nothing new. Uh, we had all these topics by and large, in different versions, different accentuations, etc., already in the Convention of 2003-2004. We have discussed this in academic and political circles throughout the last uh, decades. So, at least we could say we have now an empirical evidence <laughs> that also citizens are more or less um, in or, or uh, position themselves, themselves in, in, in this range of topics, topics. But will these resolve the problems I just mentioned? I had would put a big question mark behind that. And what fascinated me in, the lect in, in reading the, the various um, proposals and ideas and endorsements, etc., of the, the, the conference, I uh, gathered the impression that it is more about policy making, about specific policy proposals, which is fine. Uh, but is it about representative democracy? I have my doubts. Representation is one pillar of modern democratic thinking and it mainly re relates to the constitutional setup of a given polity. Trying to give an answer to the question who represents whom, uh, what and why, and who is authorized, who is given the power to act 
And last but not least, how are those who act called for justification? As the political philosopher uh, Rainer Frost always says, democracy is by and large about justification of one's decisions and deeds in the representative mode. And I use the word justification on purpose and not accountability, transparency and the like, because the European Union, as many member states, are full of modes of accountability and transparency. Sweden is perhaps the beacon in this respect in, in, in the whole of the European Union. But justification is something different. <laughs> To justify what you did is not just to report what you did, but to present argumentative reasons why you did this and that. And this would also perhaps resolve the problem uh, Guren has hinted to, and that is the problem of decisions being suboptimal because they are the result of consensus building, of compromise building. And it would be uh, great if we learned something about that compromise building and what, who had to give in what in order to get that result. Normally, I don't know whether this is the same in, in, in this country, but in mine is certainly, while well, we live in a great coalition, we always live in great coalitions in Austria, um, and everybody has to give up some of its position, his or her positions. That is not enough. I would like to learn why. If I could live with that decision, am I at the end of my uh, time? Then three more minutes. Three more yeah. minutes, that's great. Okay, um, and it is this why that we so seldom learn about, in particular when it comes to decision making at the European level. And at the European level, you do have this um, permanent uh, conflict between supranationalism and uh, intergovernmentalism, and intergovernmentalism. Uh, being, of course, let's say, the, the floor <laughs> of member states, governments, ministers, uh, prime ministers, etc., always trying to sell two different messages at the European level and at the national level. At the national level, they are always the heroes of what they obtained at the European level, but, of course, they need to come to a compromise at the European level. And uh, this creates, let's say, a, a sort of, of um, schizophrenic mind in the citizens. Who are we <laughs> when we are represented at the European level? And for this to resolve, I would like to make a proposal that um, is extremely controversial, and whenever I make it, everybody says that this woman is crazy. But I think we need to engage not only in the question what kind of policies would citizens like or don't like, etc., but how should the constitutional setup be in the first place? And for that, I am afraid we need to go into a next constitutional debate, whether we like it or not. And in that respect, we have heard the citizens now in the, in the conference, and we see it's more or less the same ideas that uh, we have been discussing the last uh, decades. Um, Building on that, I, I don't want to denigrate what has happened, although I am, was less surprised about what came out. We need to think of constitution making in, indeed, a more elitarian way. <laughs> that means that you need people who should get elected to a future convention for uh, the European constitutional setup, based on 
constitutional ideas, they should present themselves to the public in order to get elected with those ideas already in plain vision, <laughs> in plain view, sorry. And once this convention is elected and not just appointed, it also has the authority to come out with a proposal. I'm really thinking, if you, if you want to say in very old-fashioned terms, in a Philadelphian uh, philosophy, if you want to say so. And once this construct is concluded by the convention, then it should be um, presented to a pan-European referendum. And in this respect, we could perhaps resolve problems, not once forever, there is nothing like that in the world, but at least not so ad hocish as we are doing now, not in such an experimental way as we are doing now. Just think of the pandemic. The European Union had no health uh, competences, or very little. And look at it now. Th th this is, I think, not the way to go um, ahead in the future. In particular, this is my last word, not if a war, if defense and security issues are at stake. We should be better armored <laughs> for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. I think this makes a perfect start, your presentation here, uh, with some provocative thoughts, but also I'm very fascinated by how you kind of um, identify this whole volume in, in a very short question. You ask who represents who and why, and that, I think that reflects also the, the thought you have put into uh, this question, the fact that you can say it with such few words. So let me now introduce or give Ben Crum, Professor of Political Science at the Vrije University in Amsterdam, the floor, and Valentin will help with sharing his presentation. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here in person, rather than uh, on some really nice, uh, I have to admit, it's only my first time in Stockholm, so. Um, and I'll only be away already this evening, it's such a shame. Anyway. Um, we have the opportunity to discuss uh, representative democracy. Uh, Sonia, I think, really kind of put the focus on the representatives and, 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 and the place they have in the system. I'm going to look a bit more at the conditions and under which representatives can, can thrive. I mean, a lot of representatives are under pressure. There's a lot of competition, there's a lot of critique. We are all dissatisfied with our representatives most of the time, I guess. Um, um, but how can we make them strive and how can we make them strive in the European Union? And the contribution to the forum, um, thanks again, Jörn and, and Valentin, for inviting me for that, um, is, 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 is very much triggered by a kind of unease that, um, about this whole conference on the future of, um, of Europe thing. Um, I guess most people in this room and most people looking are familiar with the conference on the future of Europe. Um, I know uh, some of my best friends are very enthusiastic about it, uh, that it's really a breakthrough, that's a new way of doing democracy, that's a new impulse to democracy, that bringing in citizens' assemblies is really a great way to move beyond parties. And of course, we know that parties by now are, are generally known to be corrupt and, 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 and driven by the wrong short-term in, uh, incentives. Uh, but now we bring in the people and they talk and they de deliberate and they come up with, with, with brilliant ideas and they, they pick out the things that really matter and they ignore uh, some other stuff that are mostly political hobbies. Um, and, well, that's, that, that's a line that you hear among a few people, among a academics, among Brussels analysts, among people from Brussels, uh, even some people from the capitals, although a bit less. And then most of the people in Europe haven't even heard about the thing. Uh, so that's a bit big disjuncture, certainly when you're talking about democracy. I mean, we're supposed to be one people talking about ourselves. And if so, so, so there's a bit of unease about that. And it makes me reflect about what do we expect from democracy? Um, and also, why am I not that comfortable maybe with with this whole um, uh, conference on the future of Europe thing. So let me see where I move this forward. Yeah, all right. 
so we know that uh, 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 European democracy is, is deficient, um, that it's not working optimally, that we're still working in the process to, to make it work in a way. Um, and one way indeed to think of it is, is how do we get the motor running is by saying, well, let's open all kinds of channels. So Jürgen already mentioned two channels. We have direct elections for the European Parliament. You have indirect influence to your national representatives. Um, um, and of course, the citizen assemblies is a new way to bring in people and you have lobbies and well, I will discuss a bit. But you can really think about this. The more triggers we have, the more channels we have, the, mo the closer or the more likely we are able to, to close that famous gap between the politicians and the people. Um, more participation is always better, is the basic slogan here. And I suppose indeed that there's this big distance, that we're with so many um, and um, that it's so difficult to govern together. Uh, but it often relies on this metaphor of distance. Brussels is too far away from, um, from the people. Now, the, the other kind of counter-diagnosis of what is, what is at the heart of the problem in Europe that I want to uh, confront with that is, is very much uh, the debate about we don't have this European demos. We don't really have a common European debate. Uh, we argue about each other, about the Greeks, uh, about the, 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 the Germans, uh, but we don't have the space to really talk with each other, to look each other in the eye and to, to learn from each other. And how can we find, indeed, uh, working solutions that work for the both sides, for you and me. Um, and I do think that these two perspectives, more participation is always better, and how do we get to a modus where we can discuss across boundaries, um, that those diagnoses, they're not diametrically opposite, but they, they do look in different directions and they do come to different solutions. So, so, so that's uh, a very much... Um, uh, uh, the frame of, of this paper. Um, and I want to develop a bit the two perspectives. And I also, I think, want to warn a bit about jumping on this bandwagon that any form of participation is always good because we need more participation. Uh, so it can't be wrong. Um, maybe that's a bit too quick. Oh, that's also too quick. Yeah, there we are. Participation argument. So, so, so this line that, 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 that that representative democracy in Europe it's alone is not enough, is, is of course has a long, long trajectory. That, that of course we rely on representative democracy in, 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 in our member states, but elections are key there, but that in Europe elections don't do the job really. Uh, that's, uh, 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 or at least are not sufficient, that we need more than that. Um, and there have been different kind of uh, versions of that. So one is indeed always the, the reliance on, on member states. Then there has been this idea that, that you can do it also with functional groups. So we have the European Economic and Social Committee or the Committee of Regions. So you bring in different functional interests that people are not only represented by the, by the governments, but also by uh, uh, the socio-economic identity or by the regional identity. Um, one thing that always has been a big theme in Europe, and particularly among the Commission, is um, interest group consultation. Um, uh, the, the Commission is, 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 is a wonderful host of, of bringing in all kinds of constellations, even making sure that there's a level playing field, subsidizing weekly organized interests, even organized the, organizing them almost on their own behalf. Um, so, 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 so a lot of that has, has been made of that, that, that by, by engaging organized interests, by engaging NGOs, you can improve policy, but also legitimate it, because those it's another channel, inter another intermediary by which, in the end, the citizens are involved. Now, another trend that we have had and maybe still have is, is direct democracy. The, again, the sense is elections alone are not enough. F four years or five years in between uh, uh, parties that we cannot fully trust. So let's correct for that again and then have di direct votes on, on policy issues. And of course, we have in Europe, the European citizen initiative that allows you to mobilize, to ask for a particular law on a particular issue. And now the latest, I must almost say trend, hype here, is citizens assemblies. Um, so you ask random uh, citizens, 200, well, that's already quite a lot, um, and you let them deliberate, and, and they're, they're representative, they're very diverse, and you let it, them deliberate freely and on their common sense, literally, they come to 
great insights and they learn from each other. And I actually think they do too. But the question is whether we, you can govern on that basis. Um, and a, a lot of this is, is, is really about, uh, about, about the idea of that there's a marketplace of ideas. And that this marketplace is eventually virtuous. Of course, there's the big name of Jürgen Habermas always looming here. Communicative action, um, that if you talk, if you really listen, if you have many voices to different channels, interest groups, uh, referendums, citizen assemblies, if you have, bring them together, that in the end, good ideas will come up. Um, and that's, so, so there's a kind of, of checks and balances. There's a competition of ideas. Um, and as long as it is transparent, so we're back to kind of the alternative criteria, it's about transparency, accountability, um, uh, efficacy, and indeed ab about the quality of, of good ideas. Um, but I think there remain some issues here. One is indeed about how do we weigh the different inputs here? Uh, how do we, uh, if, if you have a referendum, and of course there's always a limited turnout, there will always be some voices lost, um, um, then often they, they, well, there's often the question then, do we have to give way to the referendum? Is the referendum right? But if you also have a citizen assembly, and if you also have an interest group consultation, which one weighs more? How do you in the end aggregate? Often in the end, we go back to representative institutions that are elected. They kind of get the inputs and they will have to deliberate again on that and reflect on it and, and also consider whether some interests have been left out, whether everything has been considered, whether it's constitutional and all that. So in the end, often you cannot get around the representatives. Often in the end, all you can have many different channels, but in the end you're still stuck with that you have to channel them to representative institutions. That also means that you have a big risk of disappointment. If you organize a referendum and the representatives in the end say, well, you know, <laughs> there are good reasons maybe not to follow up on it, on the outcome, then it's painful. If you organize a big citizen assembly and they come up with wonderful ideas and you say, well, but you know, some of them are not really feasible and, and others, there are some, 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 some minority interests and the third are, are, are really too complex and then we have a very strong opposition and then actually we need to buy off Poland because they're doing so much good work in the war. So, so there are always considerations maybe to push back on, uh, on that a bit. Um, so, so there's a, a question of, 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 of aggregation. There's a question of weighing and there's a question of, of inclusion because there are always selection effects. So the, the vote is great because everyone gets one vote. But even in citizen assembly, if you, um, some people are more articulate than others. Some people drop out during the process. Uh, some people uh, uh, need more time to de de kind of develop their, their, their views. So the question of inclusion is always very difficult in many of these alternative channels. Some interests are well organized. Some others you can subsidize, but they will never get on the, on the same level. So let me try to get to, to the alternative argument, which is, I hate to say, uh, an, an old argument that has been, of course, initiated or most famously articulated by the Bundesverfassungsgericht of all actors, the famous German federal constitutional court. Um, and it, it, it says that in the end, democracy is not just about counting votes. It's about deliberation, it's about interaction, it's about talking with each other, and we don't have the preconditions for that in Europe. Now, of course, well, we the preconditions for perfect deliberation, they're never perfect. It's not a black-white story. Actually, I think, well, the way that we're talking here together, the, the, this volume, it's a, it's a transnational volume. So at least there is a kind of elite transnational deliberation. Um, um, and I think what's also interesting is actually that, that people these days know much more about uh, uh, other countries in Europe um, than 10, 20 years ago. If you read the newspapers, a lot of it is about we know much more about Poland in the Netherlands than we knew 20 years ago. We know much more about Greece. Well, maybe not the things that we would want to know, but, but still, there's a lot of engagement with, with other countries from what's going on here also. Um, at the same time, of course, our public sphere is fragmenting anyway. We're all in little echo chambers and hearing what we want to hear. And, well, my daughters don't read the newspaper anymore. Um, uh, they, they watch TikTok and, and it actually communicates even news. Anyway, so, um, so, so, so but the basic bottom line here is it's not a black and white story. There is something like a public sphere and we can kind of nudge it forward, I think, in small steps. And the question is whether we should invest in that. Um, I have to uh, not nudge forward, but move a bit quick, more quickly. Um, so if you... What we're discussing is, so what can we do? 
Well, a lot of it is maybe just time and let things flow and wait for each other and learn from each other in Europe, but it's going to be a very slow process. Um, and then, of course, you have a bit of constitutional engineering that you can try to... And, and that's what I'm in looking at in the last section of, of this paper. I'm not going to uh, uh, get, get you through the details, but, but basically I think there's some proposals that are kind of on the table that generally find favor among... That, that well, are more participation, so they must be good from the participation perspective. So have referendums, have citizen assemblies, have uh, uh, directly elected members of the European executive uh, to, to tinker with European elections and have transnational lists. I mean, but that maybe the, the added value from the pers participation perspective is maybe less apparent. And one proposal that I always like to bring back on the agenda to have something like a permanent council of ministers of member state representatives in Brussels um, who come back to the national parliaments to uh, justify them, and who, who we know is, is our woman in Brussels, who, who we can shout against when we don't like what's going on there, um, um, uh, is something that I don't think really uh, resonates from a participation perspective. From the public sphere perspective, you have a slightly different weighing. A lot of it is indeed about how do we make things inclusive? How do we make sure um, that uh, uh, the wider people are really reached. And we know for, from citizen assemblies, they didn't really resonate with most of Europe. They didn't trigger a public debate. I think there are ways to do that, maybe. Uh, but but the, the, it, it requires a lot of, of calibration. Um, the same with the whole... You have this pitching candidate post, I won't go into the details, but, but in the end you found that it, it didn't de really deliver the public enthusiasm that you expected. And where it did, it did so in Germany, uh, because they there were a lot of German candidates, or people close to Germany, or people who spoke German at least, like Juncker. Um, so, uh, so we had democracy in, uh, European democracy in Germany, but much less in Estonia or Cy Cyprus. I have to conclude. Um, what's important is, is that these are not complete opposites, but I think there are different ways to think about what are, what are the preconditions that we should care about to make democracy, representative democracy, work um, in, in, in the European Union. Um, I think th the main risk is that we're, we're dressing up all kinds of institutions that nobody's waiting for, um, or that indeed pretend that they involve citizens, but in the end, um, we don't really follow up on them. We create a sense of enthusiasm, a sense of engagement, uh, but in the end, we look back and we say, well, sorry, but you know, the real world kicked in um, and we still had to make decisions and we couldn't listen to you. And I think that's a big risk with these citizen assemblies. We have to do them very carefully if we're going to do them again. We have to make sure that they're not instrumentalized uh, by, by politicians. So well, there's this famous Oost Belgian motto in the German part of the Belgium, where, where you have citizen assemblies setting their own, well, creating citizen assemblies, so they, they create their own agenda. I think that's, that may, if you want to do it, you have to go all the way, I think. Um, and otherwise, beware of a kind of cosmetic uh, democracy. And we still have a big chance, which is not easily solved, is that we still have to learn to talk together in Europe. And it's an uphill battle because we're actually this learning or unlearning at the national level how we talk to each other. Um, so it's even more challenging. But I think that's not a reason not to try because if we want to make democracy work, um, then it only can thrive uh, in the context of a public sphere. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for... <coughs> for this engaging presentation where you want to, to take democracy seriously. Um, I especially I picked up on your presentation. You, you helped me pick to picture a marketplace of ideas where policy can be both improved and legitimized at the same time. So now, Valentin, are you up for, for, <laughs> for the challenge to, to resolve and to keep us picturing how can we solve this challenging representative democracy? Thank you very much, Anna. Um, it's a great privilege to speak after so distinguished scholars, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, present uh, my contribution to this volume, uh, Next Generation EU and, and National Parliaments, Taxation Without Sufficient Representation? Question mark. As you see, can see from the title, um, this paper brings in national parliaments, and it brings in money. 
let me start by giving you the uh, basic ideas um, behind this paper. First, there is uh, the principle no taxation without representation. That has served as a powerful mantra over the centuries and uh, that has medieval roots and still serves as an important principle in representative democracy. Essentially, it means uh, that uh, taxes and spending must be approved by proper representative assembly. Second, the budget competence uh, is often considered the crown jewel of parliaments, and uh, we know that parliamentary strength in the budget process varies, uh, but it is an important indication of the power that a national parliament has in the political system. Third, there is Article 10 of the treaty that was already mentioned. Uh, and based on all this, the question is, uh, who has the power of the purse when it comes to, in this case, uh, the recovery funding of next generation EU? And um, in my talk, I will now uh, proceed as follows. I will... Uh, uh, looking at uh, national parliaments in the EU and national budget processes. I will then look at their role with respect to next generation EU. And finally, I will present proposals how to improve uh, the involvement uh, of uh, national parliaments now and in the future. The relationship uh, between uh, national parliaments in the EU and uh, national budget uh, procedures has developed over time. So, since approximately 2010, uh, there has been fiscal and economic policy coordination in the so-called European semester, uh, and there were rescue packages for certain Euro area members like Greece. Now, there is Next Generation EU, the EU's big recovery fund, and Next Generation EU will also shape uh, the future via the debt that uh, must be paid back and via the question of whether there will be uh, EU taxes. The instruments uh, have evolved and so has uh, the um, uh, a relationship between national budget procedures at the, at the one level and uh, European integration at the other level. In the past, there has been uh, what I, I call a co occasionally strained relationship. Just remember the bailouts uh, for Greece. Um, today, the budget procedures of next generation EU and uh, uh, national uh, procedures uh, are very closely dependent on each other. As I write in the paper, they are inextricably in intertwined. And for the future, it is clear to me that the key task is to ensure that representation is appropriate and proportionate to the nature and level uh, of uh, EU taxation. Now coming to how national parliaments are actually involved in <laughs> Uh, next generation EU. Um, just to recall, next generation EU, uh, that is the 750 billion uh, spending package, and what we see is limited involvement of national parliaments and also of the European Parliament, uh, which of course uh, adds uh, to the problem. So to, to a certain degree, one can indeed uh, speak of taxation uh, without representation, and I will come to back to that. So, what is at the heart of these uh, of next generation EU? It is uh, the National Recovery and Resilience Plans (NRRPs), and these outline investments and reforms. They contain clear milestones and targets, and uh, it is also a certain PR exercise with the Commission President coming to, to national capitals and actually then um, uh, after these plans were approved, uh, 
um, uh, presenting it with the head of state, uh, with the head of government, and uh, the most famous phrase is not uh, was not at this presentation with Mario Draghi, but with the Portuguese uh, Prime Minister Antonio Costa, where uh, he was asking, "Can I go to the bank now?" And uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, affirmed that he could do that. <laughs> um, um, this was one of the first uh, recovery plans that was approved. Generally, it works uh, in the way that there is the submission by the national government, the assessment by the European Commission, and the approval by the Council. The Polish recovery plan uh, was just approved uh, by the Council um, with, uh, as far as I know, only the Netherlands uh, abstaining on that. Uh, and. Uh, Therefore, um, it it went through, and that's the process as it as it as it stands. And you already see there is in the in these three steps uh, 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 no prescribed parliamentary involvement. There is some, and I'm coming coming to this. Uh, but um, um, the role of the European Parliament is 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 only advisory, and when it comes to the national parliaments. Uh, what we what we have seen uh, in in the early phase of these plans is uh, limited involvement because national governments could involve their parliaments actively uh, by submitting the preliminary priorities and directives of their plans, by submitting a draft of the plan, by submitting the final plan before it is sent to Brussels, and uh, they are uh, actually, um, no, no, no national parliament has received all this, but uh, they are um, actually, uh, some are more involved than others, and you can see the medium involvement, as I call it in the paper, um, is, is out there for uh, a few countries that are colored uh, in black, uh, and the lighter the color gets, the more limited it was. So, moving on to uh, the uh, third uh, part, uh, um, how to involve, based on all this, the question is how to involve uh, national parliaments now and in the future. And uh, uh, just to to divide this up into into two alternatives: how to involve national parliaments in the short term uh, and in the medium term. In the short term, the essential thing is to keep uh, national budget procedures intact and apply them to recovery money as well. There is no argument why this money should receive less scrutiny. Uh, than uh, normal uh, taxpayers' money uh, at the at the national level. Um, then it is essential that national parliaments look beyond their borders, look to look to other countries, look at other recovery plans, look at uh, exchanging best practices between national parliaments, and develop uh, collective scrutiny mechanisms. So. The, the whole idea is to increase awareness of spillover effects between plans and to take into consideration the interdependencies between uh, um, member states and their recovery plans. In the medium term, um, um, there is, as I said, the prospect of EU taxes to pay that debt back. There is the continued risk of insufficient representation. And uh, therefore, uh, representation uh, should improve, but it should not improve as a one-way street with an ever greater uh, number of veto players. And therefore, what would be required is intensified and meaningful representative uh, scrutiny throughout the lifetime of next generation EU. It's not a question of only now that these plans are, are, are approved and are put in place, but throughout the lifetime of next generation EU and at all uh, parliamentary levels. And now looking ahead, uh, and this, this goes into the same direction, 
we have new priorities uh, in relation to uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This calls for new flexibility in spending, uh, expenditure, for instance, on, on energy infrastructure, even fossil infrastructure is, is now necessary and somehow, of course, contradicts uh, the Green Deal. Uh, NRRPs are, should therefore be considered and conceptualized and seen as living documents that can be modified and adapted in response to changing circumstances. Um, but then parliamentary scrutiny is, of course, even more important uh, to have. And, of course, the question is if NGU would be or could be uh, the blueprint of another fund. To conclude, uh, the contribution in the volume uh, argues that it is normatively desirable uh, to have uh, parliamentary involvement. There are constraints. Uh, these are uh, available time and resources. But scrutinizing NGU is also in the institutional self-interest uh, of parties and MPs. Second set of conclusions. Uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, a Next Generation EU did not take a parliamentary turn at its start in 2020, but it's not too late. It could still become next generation parliamentarism in EU affairs when it comes to, um, to uh, parliamentary control. And it is an essential part uh, of uh, making EU representative democracy fit for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valentin, for this great uh, presentation where you describe how, how national parliaments may get more involved and also may contribute to the important uh, perspective of accountability. And also for reminding us of uh, the very crucial principle, no taxation without representation. And as a lawyer myself, from a legal perspective, I would also like to add that uh, res without respect for this principle, we also risk violating uh, some legal principles, such as the individual rights, such as the freedom, the right of freedom and, and privacy. I'm now very much looking forward to, to welcoming Christopher Lord, who is professor, I already mentioned it, at the ARENA, the Centre for European Studies at the University of Oslo, also joining us on Zoom due to some flight problems this morning. Please, Christopher. Well, I'm sorry that I can only join by this horrid Zoom. Um, I was caught up in Brussels, in fact, as a result of strikes yesterday. But um, it's a great pleasure to, to take part in the discussion anyway. Um, my, my chapter in the shared volume um, argues that there are two huge, huge problems facing contemporary democracies that can't, those two problems can't easily be solved simultaneously. One problem, one challenge is populism. The second one, though, is how democracies should deal with their own interconnectedness ways in which they can impose externalities on one another, ways in which they can impose harms on one another, and ways in which they can free ride on the provision of shared public goods. So those are the two challenges. And as I say, I'm going to try to argue that they're very, very hard to solve simultaneously. Populists often claim that representation kind of eats itself, representation neg negates itself. Representation in the kind of classic populist argument um, turns representatives into unrepresentative elites. Maybe they have a point. What, what could be more paternalistic than just a few representatives deciding on behalf of the many? But representative democracy is the only plausible form of mass democracy. And democracy is the only legitimate form of government for any people who see themselves as free and equal. So if representative democracy is in crisis, there's little alternative to fixing it. There's little alternative to rethinking it and refounding it. But what to use the title of the CX volume of making European Union democracy fit? for the future. Of course, this term is wonderfully ambiguous, and I'm sure it was chosen carefully as an ambiguous term. 
it could mean a European Union with its own democratic institutions and its own democratic politics, or it could mean a European Union that is democratically controlled by its component national democracies, or it could be a combination of the two, a mix of the two. But whatever the balance, I take it that citizens need to be able to control the offering, amendment and administration of all of their own laws, even at the European Union level, especially at the European Union level. So making European Union democracy fit for the future will also require two solutions to the big problems I mentioned earlier. The first of populism, especially where populism is authoritarian or where populism subverts democracy from within. The second challenge though, is the continued failure of democracies to order themselves internationally in ways that deal with their own interconnectedness. The difficulty, as I hinted earlier, is that threats posed by populism and the incapacities of individual national democracies feed on one another. Either of those two threats could be fatal to representative democracy, but the two challenges could hardly be more difficult to solve simultaneously. And that's what I'm going to try to argue in the, in the rest of the presentation. Those two challenges are hardly, could hardly be more difficult to solve simultaneously. There is a pattern, there is a pattern to recent crises experienced by representative democracies. The financial crisis, the migration crisis, geopolitical crises, COVID crisis, the climate crisis. Problems, they're all problems, they're all problems created by a world of multiple incomplete systems, complex systems, fragile systems that are continually, continuously displacing uh, difficulties into democratic systems and continuously displacing problems from one political system to another without managing externalities between themselves and even managing externalities with non-democracies incidentally, democracies will struggle to meet their own most basic obligations to their own publics, to provide security, welfare, identities, rights, justice, freedoms, um, and democracy itself. Now I spell all of that out in detail in the chapter. Closely interconnected democracies may struggle to provide their own publics with rights against polluters, monopolists, tax evaders, terrorists, traffickers, discriminate discriminators if all of those if all of those um, forms of arbitrary domination are located in other states if it is an ideal of democracy that citizens should be able to define the terms of their living together as equals democracies will need means of managing interdemocracy and interstate externalities if citizens are to have any chance of influencing choices in matters as vital to the, to the terms of their living together as controlling pandemics, providing collective security, avoiding systemic risk in financial markets or fighting climate change. Without managing externalities between states and democracies, citizens will also struggle to use their own democracy to give one another to agree rights and obligations between themselves, or to control their own laws as equals. So the standards that are most defining of the internal autonomy of each democracy have come to depend on managing interconnectedness between democracies, not to mention, as I said a moment ago, the even more demanding task of managing, ex uh, managing interconnectedness between democracies and non-democracies. Now, one reason why all of this requires new thinking is that it upends a kind of standard diagnosis of um, what is wrong with representative democracy. According to a standard critique, the main problem is a lack of competition, a lack of political competition within individual democracies. Now, it may well be that there is insufficient political competition within individual national democracies. But solving that problem on its own cannot be enough. Populism and that standard critique of um, national democracies 
when a standard critique of representative democracies, there's not enough political comp competition. Both of those, both of those suffer from the same introversion. Both fail to grasp just what it is about the contemporary world that makes democracy within the state impossible without attention to externalities between states. There is more to the voiding, there is more to the emptying of representative democracy than restricting political competition and choice within single democracies. We can imagine any number of within democracy solutions, perhaps a rediscovery of political competition through voter rebellion against cartel parties, maybe innovative ways of linking representation to the direct participation of citizens in decisions and deliberations. We've talked about all of that already today. Perhaps new ways of combining democracy knowledge and expertise. Yet rethinking and refounding representative democracy in ways that rediscover political choice and competition for the people's vote within democracies will not be enough if externalities and collective action problems between democracies limit how far single democracies can make choices over their own rights and values, as I told you about in a, 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 a minute ago. All of that, though, suggests a predicament. Managing externalities and providing collective goods seems to require both power over national democracies and control by national democracies enough control over national democracies to prevent them from imposing negative externalities on others or free riding on the provision of positive externalities by others, yet enough control by national democracies um, for their citizens, for the citizens of each national democracy to retain control of their own laws as equals. Probably the only solution to the predicament is for control of each democracy to center precisely on the means by which each democracy, each national democracy periodically recommits itself to shared ways of managing international externalities. Ambitious forms of continuous scrutiny by individual democracies could conceivably combine with periodic opportunities to review, recall or exit shared laws and authority aimed at managing externalities between democracies. Joran hinted at this when he talked about exits in his uh, introduction. However, all of that might seem a singularly implausible, even disastrous way of dealing with populism. Binding member democracies to shared ways of managing inter-democracy externalities would only make it easier for populists to portray representatives as elites eager to collude internationally to remove powers from the control of their own publics. Even periodic opportunities to review, recall or exit would imply periods of constraint by shared institutions, shared law, shared authority aimed at managing inter-democracy externalities. Populists can easily depict all of that as a frustration of the will of the people, not least because for periods, for, for, for periods of time, that is exactly what it is supposed to be, a constraint on the will of the people to impose externalities on other democracies. So it's not hard to anticipate a kind of downward spiral. Representation in joint means of managing externalities between democracies would be at permanent risk of being undermined by populist opposition in just some democracies. Meanwhile, even short-term constraints on how far policies and laws at managing, aimed at managing externalities between democracies can be varied may themselves limit political competition or vo voter choice within democracies. So we seem to be stuck. We seem to have a predicament that is unsolved. Note though, note though, that the view of representation I have just sketched, also creates problems for populists. The very identities, values, and mutual obligations that make national democracies so valuable may themselves require cooperation between states and democracies over the management of externalities. Linking that up 
with a need to revive political competition and choice within democracies. I find it by no means counterintuitive that democracies should compete more internally. They should compete more internally over how they should cooperate externally. Yet within that competition, it should not be assumed that populists will align sustainably with other defenders of national democracy. Rather, policy disasters from unmanaged externalities may align mainstream defenders of national democracies, not with populists, but with those who can demonstrate that security, welfare, justice, rights, and democracy within the state can be best secured by managing externalities between democracies. Now, here is my hope for the future, that populism within the democratic state may yet turn out to be as lonely as it is empty, that populists will be on their own um, in resisting um, the various means by which different national democracies need to commit themselves to managing externalities between themselves. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Christopher, for this very strong speech, uh, which also helps us making things even more complicated now that you talk about dilemmas that cannot simultaneously be, be solved. But I'm sure we can actually do it in a couple of minutes. Once we have heard Aziz Ahudia, who is a representative of the Prime Minister's office and who will now also share um, her perspectives from a practitioner's point of view on the Conference of Europe. And you have now heard a lot, some critique against this conference, so you have quite, <laughs> quite a project to defend. <laughs> Looking forward to this, Aziz. Well, let me start by saying uh, thank you very much uh, to Anna and Joran and CIEPS for inviting me to be here today. Uh, my idea is to give really a, a pr practitioner's point of view uh, on the Conference of, of the Future of Europe and what merit do I have to say that I'm a practitioner in this. Um, I have been very uh, heavily closely involved in the structures of the conference, but also in shaping the structures of the conference in the sense that uh, our Minister of EU Affairs, uh, Mr. Hans Dahlgren, was on the executive board of this conference and I was his advisor in, in his uh, capacity as such. Um, I have also been a member of the conference plenary and I have been chairperson of one of the working groups dealing with um, external affairs and foreign affairs uh, within the conference. And I also was the one who set up and led the, the Swedish uh, uh, government's work in organizing the conference at a national level because it is a multi-level conference that we have here. Um, which we shouldn't forget, perhaps. Um, so I'm like thinking that after, since I'm, I'm, I'm the last in a row of very distinguished and absolutely brilliant speakers, uh, I think I'm not going to go into exactly doing a commentary on the actual uh, papers, but I'm going to give my, 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 some of my, our experiences that we've had in how the conference was set up. Uh, I think we should start with the why. Dealing with the democratic deficit in, in the EU is all, often put forward as one of the reasons uh, for convening the Conference on the Future of Europe. But if we look at the joint declaration of the conference, and this is a document that sets out, it was the first document that's, uh, that was put together by the three institutions that have sort of hosted this conference. And it sets out the key objectives and the framework of the conference. And in the joint dec declaration, the rhetoric is actually more encouraging. So I'm just going to do a short quote from the joint declaration. It says, the increase in voter turnout during the 2019 European elections reflects the growing interest of European citizens in playing a more active role in deciding the future of the Union and its policies. So this was one of the key reasons that the joint declaration puts out. The Council, the Commission, we have a colleague from the, uh, from the European Parliament here as well. 
had different expectations for the conference. And this, I think, made it difficult to manage citizens' expectations of what the outcome of the conference should be and became. But there was, between the three institutions, very clearly a common ambition to create a, a new space, a new impetus for citizen engagement at all levels of government. So the biggest question was, how do we do this? And there were also diverging views within these three institutions as to how this should be done, which form of direct citizen participation could best complement our representative democracy. And using citizens' panels or assemblies, as you may wish to call them, was put forward as one of the main formats. But Eventually, only six EU countries actually ca uh, organized national citizens' panels, and that's uh, Belgium, uh, Germany, France, Italy, Lithuania, and the Netherlands. So, four uh, citizens' panels at the EU level were organized, convening the 800 citizens that we're all very aware of in this room, um, which formed the fundament of the outcomes both at national and European level. Those are the base, basic result of this conference. Now, the reason why these citizens' panels maybe were not organized nationally in so many countries was that it wasn't in, it's not an established form of engaging with citizens in many countries, Sweden included. And the national events that happened instead at the national level were very heterogeneous in nature, and so were their results. As uh, as it would be. In Sweden, our focus was very much on having a very widespread bot bottom-up uh, dialogue with citizens. Uh, the topics of the conference were very broad, so it, we really wanted something that was citizen-led. Um, but, and this was also interesting. Who are these citizens who are going to be engaging in the conference? And a key goal of the conference in the joint uh, declaration was to reach out to young people. We have a lot of young people in, in, in the room here today as well. Um, but also they wanted to reach out to citizens from all walks of life, possibly those that usually don't engage in what a lot of us have been talking about the, the elitist discussion about the future of Europe. Um, and the issue of participation and representativeness of these citizens actually became topical when some of the actors involved in the conference started viewing the outcomes of the conference as a fundament for treaty change and for legislative change. So I'll come back to these issues, but I will start by focusing a little more on the structure of the conference, the how, um, and the participation, the who, uh, at a European level. I will finally say a few words about the results and give you some, some, some conclusions, some views. So the conference was convened on the 9th of May, 2021, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, the time frame of the conference was also eventually shortened by one year. It was supposed to actually start in 2020 uh, instead of two years. And really what happened is because member states had been working a lot on, on uh, dealing with the, the pandemic and the crisis, the structures and the rules of the conference were actually developed during the course of this year. At the outset, the idea was to have a very lean structure. I think the picture says it all, whether we achieve that goal. Um, but, and we, we from the government's, uh, the Swedish government side, we perceived that the, the structures and the governance of the conference became increasingly complex as, as the work developed. And this probably affected the transparency in the process of reaching the conclusions and the proposals of the conference, and maybe even the credibility of the process. The opinions of citizens and the outcomes of national events were supposed to be fed into the digital platform of the conference. The deliberations then of the European citizens' panels were then 
supposed to be based on those ideas that were on the platform that came from a national level. It is not very clear to us to what extent this was the case. So you have your first ambiguity there. The recommendations from the panels, they had uh, three sets of meetings, four panels each, discussing all policy areas. 200 citizens in each, uh, in each panel. The recommendations for the panels were then discussed in the plenary. And now the plenary convened over 450 rep uh, representatives. I would probably say, looking around the room, there was easily 600 people uh, walking around. Um, these were representatives from the three institutions, uh, national parliaments, civil society. We had the Committee of the Regions and the, and the uh, European um, uh, Social Committee as well. Um, we had the social partners and, of course, we had citizens. Which citizens did we have? Yes, from the 800 of the citizens' panels, we had 80 that were chosen. Um, they, the ones that they got to volunteer and then they were chosen out of those that uh, volunteered out of the 800, 80 were chosen randomly to be sort of ambassadors of the panels. And then you had 27 national citizens' representatives that were also chosen in uh, a different set of ways. Some were directly appointed by the government, others were, were not. So others were maybe came from the panels. I think, for example, one of the French national citizen representatives came directly from the French panels and was chosen from them. And in these, um, uh, since there was a, a, a lot of uh, people convened, the, the idea was that we have, oh, do we need then smaller working groups to uh, facilitate an in-depth discussion on different policy areas? And the working group chairs were representatives of the three European institutions. In these deliber deliberations, the question is if political priorities, if it was inevitable that political priorities get integrated into the recommendations from the European citizens' panels. So just to give a few ideas also on participation, who participated. There will probably be um, many studies that will evaluate the representativeness of the citizens that were involved in the discussions. In relation, I think they should be, to the visibility of the conference, something, Ben, that you took up in your presentation. How visible was it? To illustrate, we can look at the participation on the, uh, on the digital platform. We only had 16% of the uh, participants on the digital platform disclose themselves as women, as compared to 47% that were men. Uh, young people and those with lower educational levels, which were probably a goal of the conference of reaching out to them, were underrepresented, uh, underrepresented compared to other groups. We do know that all EU countries generated uh, activity on the platform, but there were certain countries, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Hungary, and Belgium, that generated a, a significantly higher number of contributions. So I think further assessment is needed um, on this, but also on the participation on national events, because we have no assessment there at all. We also don't, I think it would also be interesting to do a thorough assessment of the 800 citizens that were randomly chosen that participated in the European panels and the 80 partaking in the plenary. Because who chose to make the commitment given the pandemic, given the organization, given the intensity of meetings, because there were a lot of plenaries and a lot of working group meetings, and language barriers. My last slide is just a little bit about the results of the conference. The conference cul culminated in 49 proposals with 326 measures. I would say we have 326 proposals to deal with. There, some are quite detailed, some are quite broad. Ambitiously, they cover all policy areas. 
But it is interesting to note that similar exercises in participatory democracy are usually, and using citizens' assemblies, are usually selective in the topics debated so that the, uh, the assemblies are able to really delve into a topic. And one thing that we see in the results, which I think we can be quite happy for, is that there are no extreme or populist views as we view them today um, in these uh, proposals. And the question is, did the representatives of the institutions then in the plenary have an effect on the final outcome? And I think they're an interesting uh, part of this work of following up on these uh, results is going to be looking at what were the original proposals from the citizens' panels and what were the final outcomes of the conference given the discussions in the plenary. I'll be wrapping up in about 30 seconds. So the question is now what is going to happen next? We have analyses going on by the Commission, the Council, the, uh, the Parliament. These are going to then need to go back. And I think uh, both uh, Ben and Sonia took this up, that they're go we're going to have to go back to uh, our, our representative democracy institutions. And that's where we are going to go back. And these will be discussed there. Another issue that is going to have to be handled as an outcome of the, of the conference is, of course, the European Parliament's uh, resolution uh, calling for the revision of the treaties, which will also be an issue for the European Council to uh, address. And, of course, feedback. And I know that a big feedback event is being organized by the uh, Commission in November this year. So my really, my four concluding remarks is the Conference of the Europe from our point of view, is a consultative process. It is not a process that, that remodels our representative uh, democracy, but it's a complement to it. And the proposals need to be handled within the remit of the three institutions and our uh, legislated uh, decision-making processes. Treaty change, and this is set out in the joint declaration, was never really a purpose of the conference. The Swedish government, advocates a very close and active interactive dialogue with, with citizens, with civil society, with social partners. This is something that has to continue. The conference was a very impressive undertaking and it really provided a new space that transcends the national boundaries and the language barriers that we have in Europe. And I think that this uh, dialogue must continue. So I'll stop there and I'm sorry for going a little bit over time. Thank you. You can actually stay because we're um, inviting the panel up. But thank you for adding so much clarity using such a vivid presentation uh, on, on the Conference of Europe. And now I would like to invite the, the rest of the panel up. Please take a seat for, for a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and I have thought about the, the, the opening question for you so that you all can actually elaborate on your, all your ideas. And I think that since uh, Aziz also mentioned the treaty change and Sonia uh, surely did it in her first presentation, I would like to ask you, and we have Christopher also on the screen, uh, to, to, to resolve all these challenges, do we need a treaty change or can we just do politics in a better way using the structures that are there and perhaps using Christopher's ideas about adding um, democracies, making sure that they compete better on the national arena. So please, who wants to go first? Maybe it's Sonia. Do I need to go first? <laughs> 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 well, uh, I, I think I have made, m or I try to make myself quite clear that we would need a new start that would include a treaty change. And for uh, my understanding, it would already be a big jump forward if we simply separated the TEU, the Treaty of the European Union, from the TFEU. Uh, the, the, there is hardly, uh, or you are the lawyer, you know this better than me, a constitution which includes all sorts of policies and the details how to, to go for them. So uh, I think this is a, a, a monstrum, simile, uh, Pufendorf would say, the old uh, constitutional lawyer. Um, but 
I do not think that we need uh, a big treaty change or a, a big convention to, to uh, pursue a treaty change for uh, small changes. That is, I think, uh, an investment that doesn't pay at all. And in that respect, we probably could tinker with what we have. I have just gone through a, an interview series for our project on the European semester. And um, although, in particular, the lawyers in my project are very skeptical about the legality of a number of, of issues, nobody saw those problems. <laughs> so the officers all were uh, quite reluctant to follow us in, in that way. We don't need a treaty change. All we have in the treaties is enough to justify what we do uh, with the European semester, even if we go under the skin of member states' budgetary policy. So I would uh, just say, if you want to improve uh, the representative democra democratic model at the European level, and of course this in a dialectics with the national uh, models, uh, you need to discuss again, and I would say at the highest level, uh, what do we actually expect from such a change? No, it's, I'm, I'm not pleading for a change for the sake of change. Yeah? So what does transnational representative democracy actually mean? And here I would reconnect with, with Christopher uh, and go a, a long way with, with him that the problem we have, besides the populism, <laughs> is indeed how to manage um, externalities, how to account for the, those externalities and how to engage in a transnational debate of different uh, polities and demoi. Um, because in the end, when you are under the same law, and that is what we are, you do have a demos. Perhaps the European demos is not always aware of that, but once you are subjected to the same law, then you, you do have a demos. But uh, uh, what I am uh, advocating is not so much a specific solution. We could, I could also go into details in regard to that. But to opening the debate about what kind of representative model in the transnational sphere we want to have. And I do not want to um, prejudge how that should be. Th because this, again, would be the result of a consensus building uh, measure at the European level. Thank you. And you also helped me to broaden the question even further. <laughs> that is to uh, actually, what do we, ex what would we, what do we want? What are we expecting? We want change, but what kind of change? Um, ben, are yeah. you up for, for yeah, it? Well, uh, no, my, my impression is that where we are, of, of course, there is this sense that, that something needs to be done. Um, and we have now well, a, a kind of inconclusive conference on the future of Europe. No? Um, um, there is a report, uh, what is it, 326 proposals or measures, um, um, and this is where we are, and where do we go? And I actually think that we are facing a struggle or a choice between different scenarios. And a lot of people are again projecting different expectations on where we are. Um, and I think one, the, the most kind of, the, 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 so I actually see four lines that in a way compete with each other on what they hope for or what they hope to get out of this moment. And one is very much focusing on, well, 326, let's just start ticking. And that's what, 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 what the council is going to discuss this week. No, I mean, there's a wonderful, uh, they already have a wonderful document, what can be done by policies. The commission has just done that, uh, has published its own response just last Friday. Um, what can be done? What are we already doing? And actually, it turns out we're doing already quite a lot. That's nice. Um, what needs uh, 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 policy change or new laws, maybe? Um, what is very difficult and what would require treaty change? And then it turns out, actually, that in terms of treaty change, we don't need that much. I mean, I think the Commission came with 18, 18 recommendations that may require treaty change. And if you look at those, I mean, some of them are a bit like, wah. I mean, so, so, so changing the names of the European institutions. Um, yeah, well. <laughs> Yeah, 
Okay, I, I, I can see that. I mean, there's a lot of you who speak, but, but then again, do we ha want to reopen the treaties for that? And uh, shouldn't we stick to what we have rather than uh, inventing new labels? Anyway, so, um, so, so that's one level where we're looking at. And the, the second level is indeed that a lot of people are saying, well, we should indeed use this moment to open treaty chains. Which is hardly justified, I think, because indeed, and I think the Swedish representative will be very happy with that. I don't think that if you look at the proposals, that they really give a big push to say, ah, this is the moment, we're going to reopen the treaty. I think the Commission is quite right. Look at the proposals. Most of them can be a handout. But the European Parliament, of course, is using this moment very much to say, well, let's use it. And then, funny enough, they come up with a resolution with, what is it, eight, eight points, more QMV on some points. And then again, I'm a bit like, well, you really want to start a whole big treaty revision process with referendums and a whole lot of stuff for, for, for a handful of proposals that are mostly about increasing qualified majority voting where um, there will still be political hurdles. Um, you can probably, if you want to discuss those things, you can even do this in the old-fashioned format of an intergovernmental conference. Um, so, um, so, so, so one is indeed taking down the proposals. The second line is, yeah, we want to have treaty change, even if it's just a small list of things. Then I think the third line of legacy is very much about we have to continue with citizen panels. Or we have to continue with citizen, use this moment. And from the lie is saying this, I mean, we need to have now citizen panels on key proposals. And they're going to have indeed a consultative format. I even heard a European parliamentarian talking about, well, basically, these are focus groups, which is a bit like, oh, OK, uh, long live marketing. But I'm not sure this is still about democracy. Uh, but let's be honest, they are a bit like focus groups, because in the end, very few people were watching, and it was a, a lot about testing out proposals that were already on the table. And then there's the fourth line, uh, which I think is very much disappointing. And it's, in a way, I'm sorry, it's almost Sonia's line. It's, it's very much about we still need this constitutional moment in Europe. We have a big political structure. Um, it's being used, crisis and after crisis. And we are uh, using it with kind of fixes. I mean, we come up with, with very creative well, legal solutions about handling the euro crisis, about creating some kind of health activity at the European level, uh, about engaging with, with, with Ukraine and creating a fund for that. Um, but the rules are not really up for it. We're creating them on the spot. Um, and there's a big distrust about how the rules play out and that some actors, some people have a much bigger... So the people don't own Europe and the rules of the game are not fair. But I'm not sure that this conference has brought us closer to really attacking that fundamental problem. Um, I'm afraid, actually, uh, it has deviated our attention to, indeed, uh, nice proposals um, that are rather apolitical. Thank you. I would like to hear you also, Christopher. You have um, discussed already how um, we need, may need to actually do something on the national arena to add uh, competition in the national democracy. Uh, how, what are your reflections when you hear the panelists and what would you like to add? Well, on, on, on the specific question of constitutionalization, I mean, I, I'm a great believer in the evolution <laughs> of political systems. Um, and I would like to see a kind of real-time continuous constitutionalization, by which I mean a kind of continuous reflection on the basic preconditions for us all associating together under a shared system of laws. If we're going to make laws together, what kind of obligations and uh, what kind of obligations do we owe one another? What kind of rights are involved? in um, the democratic citizens of 27 member states making, making laws together. So I would like to see a, a less talk about constitutional moments and constitutional conventions. I think a few of them may be needed, but less talk about just constitutional moments and constitutional conventions and more continuous reflection on the basic problem of constitutionalization. I mean, I think Sonia used the key word, justification. That if 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 uh, twenty seven democratic peoples are all going to get together to make laws, uh, uh, common laws which they share with one another to deal with their own interconnectedness, they need to be able to justify to one another how they make those laws. Um, but I, I would again just like to, to, to say I think Sonia is absolutely right about the um, about the, the 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 TEU and the TFU. We ought to have just the TEU and just the and just the Charter and just the charter as our constitution. I think a constitution should be something that people can put in their pockets. It should be a short statement of core principles and rights 
that people can look at, look up, check, in, um, and not and not a 365-page document such as the TFU. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a great idea for the next CF's publication, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Before I invite Aziz to, to share your final reflections, I would like to, to hear your views on this, uh, Valentin, an expert on, on national parliaments. And <laughs> um, thank you, Anna. Um, I, I, was, I was listening with great interest to the assessments of the, of the conference, and uh, I mean, national parliamentarians have also uh, uh, constituted uh, 108 members of the 450, so they were actually a large proportion of, of the plenary. But in the end, uh, national parliaments are never a collective actor. They are, they are composed of uh, very different uh, uh, national traditions. And of course, uh, most of these uh, delegations were also uh, composed of governing and opposition parties, uh, two chamber systems. So uh, this somehow hampered the effectivity of creating a joint uh, national parliamentary response or position, which did not exist, although um, the uh, conference of the European Affairs Committees in national parliaments, the COSAC, uh, has set up a working group to actually accompany uh, the conference. And uh, what Aziz said earlier is that now after the conference, it is uh, the, the, the proposals and thinking will go get back to the representative democracy institutions. Here I think it is uh, interesting to see, well, treaty change always involves national parliaments, of course, even the simplified uh, revision procedure, uh, so, so uh, actually switching to QMB involves national parliaments. So uh, in, in, in the coming months and maybe years also of the considerations whether to embark on treaty change under which circumstances and which paths national parliaments will be an even more important actor than they have been in the past. And just the, the final thought on this, um, if, we, if we think about the positioning national parliaments have taken so far, there is very little on that question of treaty change where they have positioned themselves. And uh, this, this will come, this will also be influenced, of course, by the positions taken by governments and the council and so on, but um, the the thinking with a convention and here I'm well uh, thinking about what Ben said about the different institutions positions and so on could be that well in the end if it becomes a convention it would be a very short convention, twelve hours, twenty four hours, something like that, whereas everything agreed beforehand and in even greater detail than with the joint declaration for the conference. So it will be pretty much pre-cooked and not resemble the 2003-2002-2004 exercise. Thank you. And Assis, I know you're a strong supporter of the, the conference uh, for, for good reasons. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful uh, project of democratic symbolism that also may result, have results, clear results. But having listening to the panel today, uh, I give you two to three minutes to, to, to finalize your, your vision on how this um, representative democracy uh, using the conference in Brussels, of course, with your practitioner's view. Okay, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll say a few words about the results and also touch upon the issue of treaty change because I think it would be hard not to after what we've heard. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about um, accountability and then engagement with, uh, with citizens and the importance of this. So, yeah, so when we talk about the results, we, we, we have a wide range of results. And I was reflecting a little bit on, Sonia, something that you said when you say that uh, there wasn't that much new in the results, but I think there is always a new context. And I think that a lot of issues that we deal with are not always new, even within our representative democracies. And I don't see any harm in that. So what the conference did with these results is that it has brought a new impetus into taking certain issues that have been put on the shelf for whatever political reasons. And now our representative politicians have to deal with them 
once again. So that's something positive that has come out of this, if nothing else. Where it comes to the issue of treaty change, I can only agree with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the three panelists over here. Uh, Christopher, you're on the screen. Um, where I think from, from the Swedish government point of view, uh, treaty change was, as I said, never, uh, uh, it was never uh, the, uh, the intended outcome of this conference. It was never a reason for this conference. Um, and I think that when we go into an issue of treaty change, we need to think what it is that we want to achieve and maybe have a clearer objective if there's going to be a convention than maybe what we had for the conference itself, where the convention, uh, the, the objective w between the three institutions was quite widespread. And then what what else did the conference do? Yes, it brought a kind of a sense of accountability. It's the citizens were involved, but there we had the issue of visibility and how the communication efforts worked and how, who actually got involved. And this will need uh, a little bit of further study. We need to delve into this a little more. And also going forward, we believe that Engagement and spreading knowledge about the EU and how our representative democracies work is a really important cornerstone of our democracies. If people don't know what, uh, how it works and what, what we are talking about and they don't engage in the di dialogue, our representative de uh, democracies don't work. And there I think, Ben, you were a little into this issue about you know, when we're going away from traditional medias and into social medias, how that kind of impacts things like populism or uh, the way our representative democracies work. And I think that this conference did give uh, a little more of uh, impetus and here the accountability is going to be there. We do need to provide citizen, uh, citizens who, uh, who engaged with feedback and I think all there at least the three institutions are in agreement on that issue. Thank you. Thank you very much and I will use the right of the dictator to actually close this uh, discussion and then if possible ask you to stay around five to ten minutes to, to discuss with, with the audience, as we have promised us also questions. And I would like finally to invite Joran up again to, to share his final perspectives. From my side, I, I simply want to say a big thank you to all of the panelists, first and foremost, and for your contributions, and for those of you who also attend this seminar. One of the things that repeatedly returns to this in this conversation, I think, is the merits and the strength of representative democracy and its fundamentals. I mean, one of them being that the guarantee of political equality, which uh, separates uh, representative democracy from other means and other tools, and that's something to keep in mind. But then there's also another element, I think several of the speakers have touched upon it, it's that it's through the representative democracy that we normally tend to deal with trade-offs or the aggregation. Because obviously there are tons of ideas out there of how to improve the world in various ways, but eventually, at the end of the day, it's normally our representative institutions that have to deal with those trade-offs. That can be the trade-off between how to manage national democracy and the externalities that Professor Lord talked about, but that could also be the conflicts of interest that we have, and we have to resolve in various ways, through competition, but also through compromise. And one thing that I really take with me that comes from, uh, from uh, Sonia's speech particularly, is the idea of justification. That unless we talk about these matters, unless we talk about the way in which we reach the agreements through complex bargaining and difficult processes, unless we do that in a proper way, engaging with citizens, it's really hard not to find the criticism against representative democracy. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important task. And by doing this, in a proper way, I also think we can address some of the concerns that Ben raised, namely the public sphere. Because unless we discuss it in the way we are doing here, and unless we en encourage our representatives to take this, seri this issue seriously, engage with citizens, there will eventually be this void and the feeling of being a little bit left in this limbo where politics, is, politics are decided at the European level, but politics in the way we know it is still very much at the national level. So with that said, I want to thank you all and of course wish you a very glad midsummer and I hope to see you once summer is over again. Thank you.